Good afternoon. I can't start until the drums stop. <laughs> okay, anyway, I'm only so funny. Um, welcome to Christ the King Lutheran Church, as if you're actually here. Welcome. Uh, I'm Pastor Kevin Yoakum, and this is Christ the King Lutheran Church of Riverview, Florida, and we are here for bombs. Book of the Month Bible Study. No, I'm not up to anything strange with demolitions. Just reading the Bible, all right? And you guys know that. Uh, so here we are today to um, study Romans chapter 11. Now, as I've said before, Romans, I think I said it, uh, Romans 9, 10, and 11 are kind of wrestling with the issue of Jews versus Gentiles, right? Of the time of writing of uh, the book of Romans, which would be about, the book says, A.D. 55 or so. Um, so, since I have to use this word, and it might trigger a bunch of, um, uh, uh, oh, what do you call them? It might trigger the people that are listening, uh, or the um, computations, I forget what all those are called. Anyway, I have to say the word. Jew, I need to say this. Here's my disclaimer. I am not anti-Semitic. I am not anti-Jewish. I am not against people. And uh, all we are having to talk about today is how are the Israelites and the Jewish people saved or under what conditions would the Israelites or Jewish people not be saved? And let's flip the coin. Then how are Gentiles, those who are not Israelite or Jewish, saved? Or how are Israelites, those who are not Jewish or Gentiles, or Jewish or Israelite, not saved, right? I'm not here to bash an ethnic group. I'm not here to be discriminatory in any way. God is inclusive. He wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. God is exclusive in this. The only way to come to the Father is through Jesus Christ. That's John chapter 14. All right, those are not my words, not my teachings. That's what Jesus said, okay? That God has given everyone a way to come to him through the promises, through the word about Jesus Christ. Last week we said faith comes through hearing the word, and the word is the message of Jesus Christ. All right, so we have to talk about this again. This is my uh, disclaimer. I promise no matter what the um, algorithms, that's the word, no matter what the algorithms may come up with, I am not anti-Semitic, I am not hateful, I am not Jewish hater or anything like that. I am teaching the Bible as it stands, okay? All right, so let's begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word today. We thank you that you have uh, given us the scriptures for our learning, for our uh, uh, growth and sanctification, for our understanding and enlightenment. We thank you, Lord, uh, for this lesson today that we get to uh, rejoice in and study. We ask your blessings as we do so. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Ah, uh, now... There has been, I'm a Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod pastor, right? If, you, if some of you don't know, that's what I am. I'm a Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod pastor. What's a Lutheran Church, LCMS, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod pastor? That's a conservative, confessional, historical, traditional pastor, not like some of the other Lutherans, um, the other church bodies. Uh, but there was another LCMS pastor in in the media recently and made the big news and I may not be as funny as him okay he he uh, was on uh, the TV last night uh, if you need to know what I'm talking about I'll tell you privately um, but uh, he was kind of funny and then he gave a wonderful prayer a very nice prayer all right but let's get into Romans chapter 11 it's no secret I just don't think I need to you know get repeating it here if you want to know what I'm talking about just ask me okay um, all right, Romans chapter 11. This is continuing the discussion. So the, the words here sound like he's in the middle of the discussion, because he is, because it's continuing the discussion. Romans chapter 11. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. 
For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he speak, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000, 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. All right, all right. So, uh, it's kind of simple here. He's saying, so are we saying that there, no Israelite can be saved? Has God rejected his people? By no means. Now, this has happened throughout uh, the book of, of Romans, and it happens again in, I believe, Galatians, that Paul likes to set up a question, you know, kind of like a, what are they, a straw man question, and then he attacks it. No, that's not the case. And it translates into English, by no means. Or may it never be. Uh, it would be in the Greek, meganoita, but you don't have to know the Greek, okay? Um, has God rejected his people? No. <laughs> um, for I myself am an Israelite, he says, a descendant of Abraham. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, right? So there were 12, 12 tribes of Benjamin and uh, or tri tribes of Israel, and Benjamin was one of them, along with Judah and um, all the others, okay? Don't ask me to recall them right now, but I bet I could try. Um, but I just don't have time here. Anyway, there were 12 tribes of, of Israel, and then that became, you know, all the different people groups within Israel. And he's saying, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And so I, and he says, God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. Don't you know? Even Elijah said, Lord, your people are killing me, right? They, they've attacked all the prophets, and I'm the only one left. I'm the only one left, Lord. And God says, no, <laughs> I have saved 7,000. So at one time, God promises that the number of the faithful people in the world was 7,000. But that was in Elijah's time, right? So Paul here says, uh, at the time, there is a remnant chosen by grace now, right? Um, uh, so, okay. Um, so, there's this remnant chosen by grace. God is saying, no, there's not just one of you, Elijah. And he's not attacking him, but he's helping him know you're not the only one left. There are others. And there is this, what we will call a remnant. And this is actually a word of comfort uh, that... We would even say today, are there Jewish people that are saved? Yes, there's a remnant of Jewish people that are saved. Or we might say, are there any Christians in the world? Because it might not seem like it. And yes, God would say, out of the world I have preserved a remnant of people that are saved by grace. Right? So he says here, it is, uh, this remnant is chosen by grace. And so, if it is by grace, it's not on the basis of works. No one could ever be saved by, uh, by the basis of works. And God never expected, uh, God always knew that Israel could not be saved by works, right? If you can do that, you're as good as Jesus. You are a righteous person. Uh, but no one is righteous like Jesus. No one is perfect like the Son of Man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself, right? And so, how are people saved? By God's grace. And so it is not on the basis of works, otherwise it would not be by grace. And if God saved people because of works, they'd have to take the word grace out of all the Bible, out of the whole Bible, or at least put not grace in front of it, right? This is how it goes. Uh, I have two viewers. All right. This is how it goes. That if God saves you by grace, it is not by works, right? Now, does God want you to do good works? Yes. But not for him. 
He wants you to do good works for others. Or maybe a way to say it is that he wants you to do good works for you to learn how to love others, right? Our works are to go outward to, to serve others. We, our good works are not just, what do I do for God? What do I do for God? How many times do I kneel? How many times do I kiss the Bible or something like that? But our good works are for others. But our salvation is by God's grace and mercy to us through Jesus Christ, right? All right. Uh, so, verse 7. Well, what then? <laughs> what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see, and bend their backs forever. This is the hard part. Uh, so, can people be saved? Yes. But then what about the people who aren't saved? Their hearts are hardened, right? So we walk through this. Israel, uh, the, uh, the elect, those who, you know, elect, it's a big theological word. It means chosen, right? It's a big political word. I was elected to this office. Oh, you mean you were chosen by a number of votes? Yes, right? So the elect in the Bible, if we're talking about the elect, it's those who have been elected, those who have been chosen by God. So those who have been chosen by God for salvation, the elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. And so God gave them over to their own ways. God gave them over to their rejection. God gave them a spirit of stupor so that they would continue in their rejection, right? And um, this is sometimes uh, a challenge because others will find in here uh, what we have talked about, double predestination, that God has elected some for salvation and God has elected to not save others. But the Bible doesn't say that. And uh, the Lutheran Church maintains that there is not double predestination. The Bible shows uh, and talks about God's election for salvation, but it is silent on the matter about uh, uh, did God choose anybody to go to hell um, like before they were even born. I, God knows what will be our faith, what will be our life. He has that foreknowledge, even going back to creation, knowing all things but it, uh, the Bible does not say that God has decided people will be condemned uh, just before they've even done anything the Bible says that if we are not saved it is our rejection it is our fault the Bible says that God wants everyone to be saved okay so it's kind of uh, we just can't say what the Bible says or what the Bible doesn't say, excuse me. We just can't say something if the Bible doesn't say it. So if the Bible doesn't say someone is elect for condemnation, then I can't say it. And so some churches that do teach double predestination, um, we believe they're saying, they're adding to the word of scriptures. They're adding to the teachings by saying, well, then the next logical step is to conclude that God has, no, don't say what the Bible hasn't said, right? Only say what the Bible says. That's right. All right. Uh, so verse 11 and following. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. <laughs> Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So as to make Israel jealous. We'll come back to that for sure. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? All right, this is where, uh, did they stumble in order that they might fall? No, right, by no means, 
right? He uses his rhetorical device here of setting up a straw man question, saying that's not it. Uh, really, their stumbling opened the door for the Gentiles. It's not just to say, I, I, I found you failing, now you're gone. No, he says, I found, I see that you're failing. The gospel will go to the Gentiles, right? So, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Uh, it, uh, you know, as even Paul would travel throughout, he would try to first go to the synagogue and reach the Jewish people. But then after he had done that, he would try to reach the Gentiles in the community. Every town he went to says that was his practice. Okay, so salvation has come to the Gentiles. That's good news in itself, right? That because they had at one time rejected Jesus Christ, rejected Paul's ministry, rejected the ministry of the apostles, and maybe throughout history, uh, because some have rejected the, the gospel of salvation, those messengers of salvation move on to the Gentiles and say, let me try to reach you now, right? Um, and let me try to reach you. And so salvation has come to the Gentiles. And now you get to see God's wisdom. It's not that he's totally given up on Israel. It says salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous, right? Um, so this is, I think I alluded to this last week, salvation goes to the Gentiles. And now the Jewish people can go, hey, that was our salvation. I want it. Or, hey, you're believing in Jesus. We reject it. Let me hear about Jesus again. You know, let me, let me come back to this. Talk to me about this Jesus again, because you believe in it, in the thing that I didn't like, you know. So a cheap, cheap, cheap example. Um, it's just a cheap example. I'm making it up. Is you know, someone says you should go ask her out. You know, hey, you know, teenagers or whatever, you should go ask her out. No, I don't know. Well, if you don't ask her out, I'll ask her out. Okay, I gotta go ask her out, now, right? And you know, this idea that they might miss out makes them curious about the gospel again. And let that be the same for Gentiles. Let it be the same for all who do not know Christ that then they can see people with Christ, see the blessings of and joy of knowing the gospel of forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection and have them go, hey, wait a minute, tell me again. I, I need to think this through, right? To make Israel jealous. And so he says, if their trespass, mean, their sin of rejection means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much better would it be if they act, when they come around and decide to decide and, and are brought back into the faith of Jesus Christ, right? You know, if by their rejection these people get to come into the church, how much better would it be if they come in back to the church too and say, "Yes, we're all together," right? Sometimes. Uh, someone becomes distant from the church and we're sad to see them distant from the church. We really are. I have, you know, no, no stories, but I have broken hearts over some people that have become distant. Now, when they come back, what joy there is to see someone coming back into the church to say, I, I, I want to come back. I want to be part of this again for whatever reason, you know, whatever it might be that there was their distance. And then to have them say, I'm going to come back, pastor, or whatever. I'm going to come back to church. I need to get back into church. What joy there is. And what joy there is to see people who maybe for decades and decades of their life have grown apart from their faith in Christ. To have something renew it. To have something say, you really need to get that back. And so even for us who uh, maybe haven't strayed from the church in that way and been distant from the church. What joy there is for us to see them coming back. Think the prodigal son, right? What joy there is for us to hear the prodigal son say, I have sinned. And, and to see the father welcome the prodigal son saying, hey, my son's alive again, right? But father, I haven't finished my speech of how I can earn my way back to you. 
and the father says that's right shut up I want to welcome you back anyway I'm gonna treat you like you're alive stop talking to me about having to earn your way back stop it I welcome you back right that's the love of God he he shuts our mouth uh, before we say something stupid <laughs> Because you know when you say something stupid that you, you regret it. But God sometimes just says, no, 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 you can't do any works. Stop talking. Let me welcome you back just because I want to welcome you back. And forget about works. We're not going to do that. Works is great. Works are for others. But you are saved and you're brought back into my family because I love you. And I've never stopped loving you as my son, as my child. Right? All right. Uh Turn the page for me. Verse 13 and following. Now I am speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order that somehow, uh, in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. All right. So uh, you hear this, Gentiles? Uh, I'm ministering to you, and I hope I can minister to the Jewish people too. That's what Paul is saying here. I'm ministering to you, and I hope that they can see my ministry to you and want to come back to the faith. So he's He's saying this here, you know, if their rejection means that more people can get to know of Jesus Christ, what will it mean if they can come back to acceptance as well? You know, life for the world, life from dead, and uh, welcoming all of them. All right. He gives two examples like a dough is offered as the first fruits, so is the whole lump. Um, and if the root is holy, so are the branches, right? And, and just this idea of saying that it all is included in the grace, all right? So, uh, verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you, if you are, remember, or excuse me, if you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness toward you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, uh, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from, the, from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree how much more will these the natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree all right all right farming time right vineyard time uh, and i would not have known this unless someone would have taught me really specifically you can cut a branch off from a tree right Duh, right? We get that part. But the amazing part is that another branch could be grafted in. And uh, this was not, you know, we, we understand grafting sometimes by surgery, like skin grafts or whatever. But the first way was in farming. You could attach something foreign to the tree, another tree part from another tree to the tree, and it would be welcomed in as part of the tree and it would grow. Now, uh, that to me seems amazing in itself. That's God's world. That you And here's what I heard one time. So, uh, apples, the sugar content in apples is determined by sunlight. 
Now, if this is true, go with me, right? So, you know, you see these, you know, you think of Washington apple orchards. Someone started a Granny Smith apple orchard, Granny Smith, the green ones, in Arizona. In Arizona, sunlight, right? And they, in order to get this business started, they had some trees there already, but they grafted in mature apple branches into this tree so they could get the fruit, their product, right? A crop going soon so that they could start making money soon, right? And they did this and they grafted apple branches into these uh, mature trees um, and, and our young trees, but mature apple branches. Uh, and they got these, they got these uh, crop of Granny Smith apples going in Arizona. And I never would have thought an apple orchard could grow in Arizona in that much uh, sun, but amazing. And I, I tried some of their apples. Gee whiz, it would put you in sugar shock. There was so much sugar in those Granny Smith apples. They were as big as softballs. And they just, you know, were so amazingly Granny Smithy, apple-y, tarty, right? So this is what it's saying is, sure, Israel branches were cut off from the tree of Christ because they rejected Christ. They were not living in Christ. So you cut off a branch that's not living. And then these foreign branches, uh, and you know, this is an olive tree in the Bible example. These foreign branches of Gentiles were grafted into the tree of Christ. They were not born in Christ like Israel branches were, and yet they were brought in and grafted in uh, and brought into this tree. You might think of like families and adoption, you know, brought into the family. But this is talking about uh, the example of trees. And so don't be proud, don't be arrogant, go on you little dead branches, you're just a bunch of sticks, because the same could happen to you. Because if God will get rid of that branch, won't he get rid of yours too, if you're going to be an arrogant, lifeless, non-Christian trying to live in Christ, right? God could cut you out just as easily as he cut off the other branch. And so you need to kind of be aware that God has shown you kindness and brought you in so that you can live in Christ. But God can just as easily be severe to you. That's the words here, kindness and severity. If you are going to show that you don't want to live in the branch or in the, the tree of the olive, olive tree, uh, and you don't want to be a living branch in that tree, he'll cut you out too. But what we rejoice in is that God has brought you in, you Gentiles like me, and brought us into the tree of Christ, and he's also bringing back Israelites, bringing back Jewish people back into and bringing them to faith again so that they can live in the tree of Christ as well. So the good news is that not only is he bringing in the Gentiles, but he's also bringing back in Jews who believe in Jesus Christ. Okay? So is it ever by, you know, where they're just saved because they were their blood is Jewish? No. That, that was never the case. They were saved by the covenant promises. And that you could see throughout the Bible that those who rejected the, to live in God's covenant were not living in the salvation that God promised. You can see that in the Old Testament. But uh, in the New Testament as well, it's not because you're just born that way. It's not because you do works, but it's because by grace and faith, same as in the Old Testament, by grace and faith are you saved, right? By grace you are saved through faith, not of works, so that no one can boast, right? Through Christ, by grace, through faith, right? Okay, so, um, so we can rejoice, you know, that I'm a living stick in Christ. <laughs> and we can rejoice that you're a living stick in Christ, a living branch. And we can rejoice when new living sticks grow out of the tree. And we can rejoice when, when sticks are brought back to life in the tree and brought and grafted back into the tree of Christ. What good news it is when we see a, um, an estranged believer, a Jew or a Christian, who's brought back to faith in Christ.
What good news that is. All right, verse 25 and following. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Technically, this, the paragraph goes on, As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have rece received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you they may all they may now they also may now receive mercy for god has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all so here we are understand this yes god has allowed a partial hardening to come upon israel and I think we got to hear those words very specifically. He has not said a full hardening, a partial hardening. Some are hardened uh, in their rejection. That's the best way to say it. Uh, so that Gentiles can come to faith. And, and then it says in 26, as it is, and, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. Now we got to look up the footnote for this too. The manner in which it is accomplished, not then, as understood by some uh, millennials, millennialist views, but it says all Israel will be saved, all children of the promise, the spiritual Israel, those living by faith, not by just their blood or by their works, not children of the flesh, as in some might say the nation of Israel. All the elect, both Jew and Gentiles, will be saved throughout history. So, uh, are Gentiles saved? Not all of them, right? Not everybody is a believer in Jesus Christ. Are Jewish people saved? Not all of them, right? Not everybody is a believer in Jesus Christ. So, how are, are we saved? By God's grace. By God's election, which is grace. He has chosen uh and some people come to faith in Christ, all right? Now, there's there's a hard part here that we can't answer. I got to say that. We can't answer, what about the others who aren't saved? We have to say, for one, the Bible shows that, you know, it is considered their fault if they reject Christ. But on the other hand, we might say, why doesn't God give them faith too? Now we're going someplace that we can't find an answer for because scripture hasn't told us. So there's some questions that you and I are gonna wonder about and come up with that the Bible doesn't answer. In other words, to say God doesn't tell us the answer to that question. Why doesn't God save everybody? Now, we can come up with partial answers, but the full answer, there's no answer for. Okay, now don't distress because God's taken care of this, all right? He may not tell us what he's doing, but he is all-knowing and all-gracious and all-merciful, and uh, he knows what is best. And so when he deals with this, he's holding the problem in his hands, and we don't have to wrestle with that problem. What we do is we say, I want to tell everybody about Jesus Christ. I don't want to find out that I could have uh, shared the, the name of Jesus Christ to someone and I wouldn't or didn't and I missed the opportunity. Right? I want everybody to be saved just because God tells us everybody. I want everybody to be saved. right? And so uh, if we say, then why aren't some people saved? The best answer we have for that, the, the best and fullest answer is, God knows, but I don't. 
okay? If, you, if we're trying to get to this. So what do we do with some people that in our lives that we might think, I don't know if they have salvation. I don't know if they have faith in Jesus Christ. Or I don't know if they have faith in Jesus Christ anymore. See, that's the scary part, isn't it? If we say, I think they used to believe in Jesus Christ. I thought they believed in Jesus Christ, but I don't know anymore. That's right. For one thing, you don't know. So don't give up because you don't know. And also, it's not over. So don't give up, right? Find the opportunities. For one, pray daily for those people that are on your heart that uh, are not or are not showing that you can tell that they have faith in Christ. Pray for them. As much as they're on your heart, pray for them daily. Okay? Because who knows, right? God still, if, if they have a beating heart, God can still grant them faith. Right? And if someone dies, also, we can't fully know what the answer is. God knows. We don't. Like, so it, it, do we take, for example, uh, my grandmother. I'm not exactly sure uh, what her faith was. Um, but God does. And I I trust my Lord. I trust my God. So I, I will not tell him what I think his answer needs to be. But he knew what to do that was best uh, when my grandmother died. Right? And we also can't fully, finally say, well, I know this person has got to be in heaven. Now, we could say there's a lot of evidence to show that this person is in heaven. But fully, God hasn't given us a certificate <laughs> saying uh, at the time of death my angels brought this person in, you know, into the presence of the Lord <laughs> um, you know so we just know that salvation is in God's hands and we might guess or assume uh, with res reasonable evidence that some people do have salvation uh, just because of what we can see and we might guess or assume that some people based upon visible evidence that some people are without salvation just based upon what we can guess and see. Um, but in either case, God knows. And in either case, pray for the faith of people, of, of people that you know, of people that don't know Jesus, of people that uh, are on your heart. Uh, and you say, I, I really, I don't know if they've continued in their faith. Uh, continue to pray for them, right? That they would have a faithful witness come to them and show them the, the, the good news and the promises of God. That the light of Christ and, and his mercy would shine on them. And maybe they could be grafted into the tree. Or maybe they could be re-grafted into the tree. All right. Um, I am probably... Oh, I, I got just enough time here. All right. So, um, let's get to verses 33 and 34. And... 30, 33 through 36, all right? And then that's the end of the chapter, all right? Uh, God, uh, Paul breaks out in praise, really. Oh, the depth and the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of Christ, the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So really finishing this chapter up and, and saying, we can't give up on the Israelites. We can't give up on the Jewish people because God hasn't. Paul takes this opportunity not to just go, huh, I wonder how it's going to end. But Paul takes this opportunity to say, oh, how great God is. How, uh, oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. God is so great. He's so wise. He's got so many rich blessings for us. He's got such great knowledge. How unsearchable are his judgments. I don't always understand what this is about, right? And how inscrutable are his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? We've all tried. We've all tried to know the mind of the Lord. We've all tried to be his counselor, right? Now, God, tell, let me tell you what you got to do. This is the best thing to do. Uh, now, this is me talking to you, not someone else who's fake. But, you know, we've tried to convince God that he really needs to see things our way, right? 
And I, oh my goodness, how silly we are when we just say, Lord, you have to do it my way. And yet sometimes we try, don't we? We want something so bad that we plead to the Lord for it. And plead to the Lord. But at times we may turn into his boss. And he, he won't ex accept that. And at times we may have silly prayers and pleas. And he says, I'm not going to grant that. And at times we may have something that seems to make complete sense to us. But for his own reasons and in his own plans, he chooses not to grant it. Who has been his counselor? Well, many have tried, but few have succeeded, right? No one can be the counselor of God except the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit counseling within themselves the Trinity, right? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid, right? Does God owe us? I've been so good to you, Lord. I did you favors. Now you got to pay me back. No, no, no. God is just God, right? And so from him and through him and to him are all things. It's all to the glory of God. It all comes from God and it all comes to us and it all comes back to God in his choosing. Uh, and so to him be the glory, to God be the glory forever. Amen. And on this, we're going to stop. Okay, so I'm going to close like I usually do with the prayer that's in the, the footnotes of the Lutheran Study Bible. To you alone, O Triune Lord, belongs all glory forever. Amen. Just a hymn of, or of a prayer of praise. All right. God be with you this week. And uh, the Lord willing, I'll be back next week with Romans 12 which is fun. It, no, it is. It is. I promise you. All right. And we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye.